and I, I, I was at a, an ergonomics conference a couple of weeks ago, and this guy was telling about his wife had something. And then they're rocker bottoms. They got a they got a rocker bottom. That's all they are. And so I think the thinking is maybe if there is any design, really a, a, a design to it, is that the rocker bottom kind of pitches you forward, and it and and I guess keeps keeps you active or keeps you moving, which is kind of weak. But he said that his wife began to experience posterior knee pain, and the reason is because of the rocker bottom. You either moving forward or you're rolling backward. And yeah. when she stood for a long time, it just kind of kicked her into this oh in this hyperextension here. Well, they did so he he got her out of. She was out of balance. Yeah, that's really that's exactly what it is. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's let's move along. Uh, ACSM <laughs> risk stratification guidelines. So. We want to know how in intensely to exercise for the benefits, but we also, also want to know how intensely to exercise to avoid the risk, to make sure that we're safe. So ACSM has come up with, with those two. And what they've basically done, because they, they, they've relied on the coronary risk factors to determine how safe it is to exercise, and this is why. If you get to exercise and you may pull a muscle, you may even break a bone, generally you're going to recover from that. But if you blow your heart up, that's kind of hard to recover from. And so really exercise intensity uh, principles are basically based on how healthy your heart is. So the coronary risk factor, we're going to blow through them first and then we're going to come back and I want you guys to count how many you got. No, so, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you. Kind of, for ourselves, you mean? Yeah, okay. for yourselves. Uh, the first one is high blood pressure. And high blood pressure, blood pressure 140 over 90. And it, if you have one but not the other, let's say your blood pressure is uh, 125 over 96, you've got high blood pressure. Now, we, we did a minute ago, we kind of specified that this has to be uh, over more than one reading. So if you have consecutive readings on different days that have you higher than these numbers, then that would suggest you have high blood pressure. So does that make sense? E either number over the numbers here, either over 140 or over 90. That, that top number is your, your systolic, the bottom number is your diastolic. And you know what that represents? Squeezing, mm -hmm. yeah. systolic, and rest. That's right. Systolic is when your heart's contracted, and the systolic, the bottom number, is the blood pressure when your heart's relaxed. Okay, so next coronary, oh, went back. Next coronary risk factor, of which they're eight. They're eight. So abnormal blood cholesterol. That can mean you have a, a total cholesterol over 200. Or it can refer to your, your LDLs, which is your bad cholesterol, right? And if that's over 130, you have abnormal cholesterol. Or your HDLs, we want those are good, that's a good cholesterol. We want those. So a low number is bad. So if you're under 40, then you have abnormal blood cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So for those of you, that's why that's why I was interested in you, because I didn't know if you guys remember some of those numbers. Yeah, maybe. How high can HDL get? Uh, you know what? You can actually, if your HDL is over 60, they actually will take a, a, a risk factor off. Yeah. You can reduce it by one. So that, optimally, you want your HDLs over 60, but I think the normal range is between 40 and 60. Yeah, mine's 70. And the HDL is the good. That's the yeah, good cholesterol. And that's really exercise that gets it to that level, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exercising is exercise and diet are the two things that yeah. affect yeah. Your cholesterol. Okay. All right. Everybody cool with that? Tobacco use, any kind, and any frequency. They they throw that in on. Sorry, guys. Surely you're not going to put alcohol up there. No, alcohol you know, is really alcohol is considered one of the, the five healthiest behaviors. Thank you. But they don't they don't tout it a whole lot, but it, it can only be one drink a day. One consumption. Drink? One drink. One drink a day. What about and you, and you can't front load that either, Gary? You, you know, can't all be. Yeah. It's say what size <laughs> drink. Just <laughs> 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 say what the consumption was. No, 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 you got to spread them out. It's kind of like the exercise. Too. What about snuff? Snuff is tobacco. <clears throat> and so in any form, fashion, any frequency. You know, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm a, rec I'm a recovered, recovered or recovering snuff dipper for 25 snuff. years. So, uh, in, in the studies I read, not, not to, not to alienate anybody. And this wasn't what motivated me to stop, but uh, but I think that the effects on your arteries is 
is increased with snuff because your ability to and nicotine goes right into the bloodstream instead of making its way through your lungs mm -hmm. and then to your bloodstream. So, what made you stop getting married and having kids? No, no, oh, gosh, no. I thought that might have no, I, I think for me, I, not that I've shared with this with some ladies here. I think what made me stop is I got to a point where I felt like I was, I was orchestrating my life around snuff, and that made me feel real small. Instead of, you know, I can have snuff and take it and use it whenever I want to. And, you know, and I don't know talking with people who smoke and do anything else, that's kind of a compulsive behavior. If, I, if my whole life is orchestrated around that, and, and so that just bothered me. And it, it didn't make me stop right away. It's over years that, I, that irritated me, and I finally decided, you know, I'm going to quit. You know, my wife passed me probably didn't know her. <laughs> um, family history, I didn't talk about that. That's an immediate family member that's either been diagnosed with a heart, a heart disease or, or lung disease, or that has uh, metabolic syndrome would count as having a positive family history. And you guys familiar, you guys comfortable with metabolic syndrome? It's kind of a group of, of disease processes like prediabetes, obesity, heart disease, lung disease, all those things kind of together are considered metabolic syndrome. Um, and prediabetes, that's having a glucose level between 100 and 125. Again, that's, that's on multiple readings, so, and that's fasting glucose. So if we took your glucose right now, all of you guys are going to be way above there because you just got through eating sandwiches and stuff, and, and fruit in particular. But if your fasting glucose is between 1 and 125, that's pre-diabetes. Diabetes is having glucose over 125, again, multiple readings. And then uh, sedentary lifestyle, which, um, man, I can't. I mean, you just like you read that out of a book earlier, Diane. Oh, well, you said so, it last week or last time. <laughs> and, and that's really, that's, the, that's the, the minimum amount, basically, is to exercise three days a week for 30 minutes. Other than, if you can't get that much in, then you're considered sedentary. And that's not a, you're not name calling, that's just, you know, in the medical world, that's, you don't get a whole lot of activity. And then uh, obesity. Obesity is having a BMI that's equal to or greater than 30 kilograms per meter square. And did, your, did they put your obesity levels on? I mean, obesity levels, sorry. Your BMI levels on, on that sheet? Okay. Yes, they did. If <laughs> another way to get it, because some of you know that, that the BMI score can be a little bit inaccurate if, uh, if you have somebody that's kind of carries a lot of a little mus muscular weight. Because really all it is, is it's a, it's a ratio of height versus weight. So if you've got somebody that's very heavy because they're carrying a lot of muscle, like that knucklehead in here we saw a minute ago, then he's going to have a very high BMI. So they kind of came up with another way just to account for those guys. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a female and your waist circumference is greater than 35 inches, that's considered obese. And then for males, if, you, if waist circumference is greater than 40 inches, that's considered obese. So, Anybody want to figure out their BMI score right now? Because it's, I'll write it up here so you can do it if you want to. Now I figure most of you guys have phones and stuff so you can put a calculator on. But here's a way to figure your BMI scores. 703 times your weight in pounds divided by your height in inches. Okay, Seven, 703 times 703 weight. times your weight. And then we're going to divide it by your height in inches. You got to do that square. So tell me when you get there, and I'll tell you what to do next. 703 times your times your weight, and then divide it by your height in inches. So I'm I am six foot, which is so 12 times six is 72 mm -hmm. inches. And if you're that's five foot, that's 60 way. inches, and if you're five foot six, add another six inches. <coughs> okay, do you take that number, you divide it by what? Divide it by your height in inches. How tall are you? 6'3". Okay, so you're 75 five. inches. So divide that by 75, and then divide it by 75 again. And nobody, don't, don't blurt out your BMI. <laughs> Well, I barely made it. <laughs> well, over 30 and over is considered obese. Between 25 and 30 is considered 
uh, overweight, and then I think it's 19.9 to 24.9 is considered normal. Normal weight. Is that all of them? Mm -hmm. well, we got one more. We're good on BMI. Seven oh three times your weight divided by your height in inches, and then divided by your height in inches again. That's what we're Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. Here, I'll just do it first thing in the morning, and then divide by height in inches again. Pretty interesting. What was normal? What's that? Normal is uh, 19 point nine to twenty four point nine. Actually, no, no, it's twenty to twenty four point nine. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I'm a twenty five. So by those standards, I'm a hair overweight. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I mean, I, I carry a little bit, maybe a little bit more <laughs> muscle than than. Uh, does that mean presumptuous? Yeah. Well, than, sure. than, than maybe the average guy for my weight. So I know that I'm okay. Yeah. But, but I also know I can stand to lose a few pounds, too. So I think yeah, it's pretty accurate. Good. But isn't there some deal that some people are bigger boned than other people, and they don't carry? Absolutely. And I mean, if I went on that chart, I have to move to Africa and move those kids if I weighed what they did. I'd be that <laughs> I mean, there's no way my height, I can be 170 pounds. That would play. seem, yeah, that's that's not it's right. We need to figure yeah. years ago. Yeah. There's that's, no that's way. Because, see, I, my my weight at 186, I'm normal weight. So yeah. I, I think we need to figure years again. Yeah, because that's, well, I just look at some of those charts they have now. But yeah, and you got to remember, these are just stand. I mean, basically, yeah, I just looked at hundreds, people, you know, thousands different. and thousands of people, and they're, and they're making determinations of that. So yeah. you use this stuff as a guideline. Yeah. <laughs> We know everybody's a little unique. Okay, so here's the thing I want to kind of talk about. we got one more. Age. Age, if you're female, I mean if you're male, I'm sorry, 45, if you're over 45, you have a risk factor. Yep. And if you're female, over 55, you have a risk factor. So, I think if, if March, look at this stuff. How many of these things can you, can you do nothing about? Family history. Family history and age. Age. Just two. Age. So six of the eight are really behavior oriented. You can control them. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, that's, that, if there's really no take home that's message, I mean, that's the take home message today, really, more so than anything else. That the lion's share of our coronary risk is based on our behavior. Okay. So low risk, what does that mean? Someone. Someone who's looking at those eight coronary risk factors is asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any heart problems. They're not, they're not having shortness of breath. They're not uh, having chest pain, ang angina. If they go up the stairs, they're not unduly, you know, taxed and winded from that. So you're asymptomatic. You have no more than one coronary risk factor. So, you know, yeah, you can have family history, uh, but nothing else. You can be a low risk. And what that means is you can do anything you want. You can engage in high intensity activity, mm -hmm. exercise. Um, which is 70 to 85 percent of your maximum heart rate. We'll talk about that here in a minute, so don't feel like you got to memorize that. But what I do want you to do is identify which risk category you fall in. Am I low risk, am I moderate risk, am I high risk? Moderate risk is somebody who's asymptomatic again, no signs or symptoms or problems. They have two or more uh, risk factors. And I would guess that that is the majority, if not all of us. You know?